Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in the Big Brothers Big Sisters virtual conference. We're delighted you've joined us for this training session today. I'm Tanya Gibson, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Human Resources at Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. And we're excited to present Chat and Chew Lunch Session, COVID-19 Implications for Communities of Color, presented by Dr. Shirley Davis and Dr. Shelton Good. As President and CEO of SDS Global Enterprises Incorporated, Dr. Shirley Davis brings a unique background as a seasoned HR and diversity and inclusion global thought leader, a senior executive, a certified leadership coach, and a former chief diversity and inclusion officer for several major Fortune 100 companies. She's worked in more than 30 countries on five continents and delivers more than 80 speeches a year. She continues to consult, coach, and present to leaders at all levels of an organization in all business sectors and across a number of industries. Dr. Shelton Good is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Icarus Consulting. Icarus Consulting is a veteran-owned firm which helps companies build a diverse workforce and create an inclusive workplace. This is accomplished by partnering with clients to develop strategies to attract, develop, and retain highly skilled talent from an emerging diverse workforce, and at the same time enhance the engagement, knowledge, and skill of current employees. Dr. Good has over 20 years of HR and DNI experience, and he has held executive positions in several global companies. All lines are muted, but you can ask by typing your questions into the question box today. We will address most questions at the end of today's session and hope to answer all of your questions during our time today. If not, we will follow up with you after the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and you can access the recording later in the on-demand video library on the conference website. As a reminder, the virtual conference will end on June 20, the virtual conference will end on June 26 with a celebration recognizing BBBS agencies, matches and the national bigs and littles of the year. Make sure to check out the conference website for more details on this event and the full list of trainings being offered during the virtual conference. We would like to begin with a brief survey to familiarize ourselves with today's audience. At this time, please view the slide in front of you and follow the directions to respond either via text by texting bigger together, no spaces, to the number 22333 on your cell phone. Once you're prompted, you can respond to the first question on, your, on the screen, or you can respond to the poll by visiting the URL pollev.com backslash bigger together to enter your response at this time. You'll have 10 seconds left to complete this poll. So if you're able to, please either visit pollev.com backslash bigger together to respond to the question, or you can text bigger together, no spaces, to the number 22333. And once prompted, you'll be able to enter your response on your cell phone. Thank you for this first response. The polls are now closed. We'll now move on to our second question. So again, the instructions, you can either text to the number 22333, and once prompted, you can enter the word bigger together once you've received the prompt, you'll be able to then answer the question for number two, which is what is your age? And be able to answer A, B, C, D, E, or et cetera.
There are now 10 seconds remaining for this poll. So again, you can either visit pollev.com backslash figure together to then answer the question, what is your age? And provide your response with either A, B, C, D, E, or et cetera. Or you can answer your answer on your cell phone by texting the number 22333 and entering figure together. Once prompted, you'll then be able to enter your answer a, B, C, D, E, etc. And polls are now closed. Thank you so much for your participation. At this time, I would like to introduce to you our two speakers for today's Chat and Chew session, Dr. Shelton Good and Dr. Shirley Davis. Well, good afternoon, good everyone. It's great to be here. I am thrilled to be partnering with my friend and colleague and co-laborer in this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for joining us again. And again, for those of you who had the opportunity to join us yesterday, welcome back. Hey, Shelton, how are you? Hey, Shirley, how are you? And so, um, like you, super excited to uh, be back for those of you who uh, joined um, yesterday, in yesterday's session. Uh, where we had a uh, good conversation with the CEO, Pam. Uh, welcome back again today, and um, thank you for uh, your questions yesterday, and thank you for your participation um, in the poll. So let, let me set a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of context for what you're going to experience um, today. Um, first, in the spirit of total transparency and candor, uh, Dr. Davis and I have known each other for a long time. There is no one in this space that um, I admire more. She has um, been recognized by um, everyone in our field as one of the, uh, one of the top leaders um, in the field. So you're gonna, you're gonna experience a, a candid, authentic, um, courageous conversation between two people who are experts in the space, but we also know um, and admire each other. So uh, an hour is not gonna be enough time. Shirley and I have been talking about this and try to get this narrowed down, but just because of everything that's going on, it's not gonna be enough time. So let me say ahead of time, we encourage you to reach out to us after the session. If there's a question or an issue that you wanna continue the, 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 the dialogue on, um, at the end of the session, Tanya will be sharing our uh, social media um, and email information. We encourage you to uh, do that. We're going to try to, it's going to be a, a conversation between me and my friend, but we're also going to make it interactive. We'll, we'll stop and um, we'd like to hear your thoughts and reflections on what we're talking about, as well as solicit your questions um, both during and um, after the session. So with that, we're going to jump right into this. Tanya, thank you for that, that generous um, introduction. But I think, um, surely, people uh, would like to know um, a little bit more insight. That's the stuff that they can get um, you know, on LinkedIn or you know, Google if they were to Google us, but I think they want a little bit of insight. And so I'll go first and say, um, who is Shelton Good? Um, I'm, I'm a father, a grandfather, and I'm, I'm proud of uh, both of those things, uh, a husband to, um, to a, a wife who's also in the diversity space. And my passion in, when I'm not working is um, listening to music and I'm old school. So I'm probably one of the few people that um, left that uh, has probably probably close to 10,000 albums. And I actually have a turntable that I play those albums Ooh. on and listen to them okay. through my headphones. That and is old with school, all this. You still got a turntable? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a little bit about me. Shirley, top that. Well, give me more of your favorite R&B old school group. Uh, my very favorite? Of yeah. all time, the the Osley brothers. Osley brothers. Yes, all right, sir. mine is yes, Earth, Wind, and Fire. So not far okay. from each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, hi everyone. So you've already heard a little bit about my background, and you heard some of that yesterday as well. So I'll tell you some things you may not know. Um, I actually was born on Juneteenth. So yes, I am now away on vacation, but I had to be with Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America. So I am literally on my vacation sharing it with you. And after this session is over, I'm heading right across the street to the beach. Uh, so not only was I born on Juneteenth, but I was actually that year 
born on Father's Day. So I am a gift to my dad and he is still alive, 77 years old. So I'm excited to, to be a daddy's girl. I'm in Tampa, Florida, that's where I lived. I moved here four years ago because I am a punk in the cold weather. I wanted to be near the warm weather <laughs> all year round and the best beaches in the country. And I'm an <laughs> HTV junkie. I absolutely love, love, love. Uh, House Hunters, House Hunters International, all kinds of flip-flops, everything. So I'm an HGTV junkie and a movie buff. So that's just a little bit more extra about me. And I have a daughter who is 26. And I like to say that because every time we go out somewhere, people always say we look like sisters. So I am easily able to say <laughs> I'm 50-ish, looking 30-ish, feeling 20-ish. So anyway, welcome, everybody. Yeah. It's great to have you. <laughs> Well, uh, Shirley, I know that uh, I speak for myself, uh, for Pam, uh, and then the 581 participants that we currently um, have nice, um, nice. to join us today when we say happy birthday. I'm oh, not okay. going to embarrass you by, by doing my Luther Vandross impression, but uh, when we're off camera, I'm going to call you and, uh, and, and sing happy birthday to you. Sing it on my voicemail. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let's 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 go ahead and jump into this. There's so much okay. going on, Shirley. Uh, I'm sure you, like me, are are busy these days. Everybody is calling to ask us advice and counsel on things we've been talking to them about for years. We yes. now have a captive audience with open ears. So so yeah. tell me, your phone's ringing off the hook. Yes. Tell me, you know, what are people? What's keeping people up at night? What do they want from you? You know, tell me what's going on with you. Yeah. So my world absolutely flipped upside down about two and a half months ago with the pandemic, right? This global pandemic took right. everyone by surprise. And then the second pandemic hit, right, where we're seeing the economic downturn and we're seeing the impact that it has had. COVID-19 has had even more so disproportionately in the black community and people of color. Uh, and then right. third pandemic, right, has been this civil unrest and these protests and the injustices that we keep hearing and talking about and unfortunately seeing live and in person with video of the killing of unarmed Black Americans. And that's really the reality of the day, but the injustices are not anything new. I'm thrilled, though, to see. I have been so excited and humbled and, th and just... Um, uh, it's been a pleasant surprise to see so many people, black, brown, white, yellow, all kinds of colors, ethnicities, backgrounds are out and about saying this has got to stop. We've got to have some change happen. And so I appreciate the many people who have stepped in and said this is unjust. This cannot be the reality of America today and that we've got to really focus on having some real authentic and tough conversations but to really make some change. So that's been a lot of my um, sort of the, the conversations that I've been having is clients, new people have called me from all over the country wanting a couple of things. So the biggest thing is, hey, help us with messaging. We wanna make sure we get this right. Or right. some of them who went out there too soon, too quickly, didn't get some insight and some coaching from diversity experts and say, oh God, right. help us. Right. We've been tone deaf, right. we sent some stuff out and then get <laughs> some backlash. So that's been some of my right. calls, coaching to both position the messaging, but also how to re revisit and, and rewrite the, 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 the comments. The second thing has been listening sessions. So we've got, gosh, got 18 over the next couple of weeks. And then in July, it's, it's over 20 something we've been scheduling all day because people want to nail, and I've been so, again, proud of everyone really wanting to lean in and have these conversations that have really been considered taboo and sort of right. sweep it under the rug, don't want to hear it, don't want to talk about it. But now people are saying, is this really what's been happening? I've been sort of in a bubble. My white counterparts, my white friends and, and colleagues, I had no idea. Let's talk about it. I love to listen. I love to learn. So we've been doing a lot of listening sessions. And then, you know, it's not enough, Shelton, to do a statement and then listen. Then you got to do something. Right. So we're now, you know, consulting and coaching with them on helping to build strategies to help stamp out the inequities in their systems and in their institutions and in their policies and then do some training right. and education right what about well, you? you know and, and yeah they're the same they're absolutely the same um everybody wanted to rush to put out statements and i tried to get people to take a, a breath and and to think through um the statement but then what are you going to do 
yeah. um, following the statement because we, I try to help them understand that your employees are, are watching. They want to know what you're going to do, your, your customers. And we've seen even just this morning, right? PepsiCo and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, Quaker Oats are now having to you know, yes. look at uh, something that people have been telling them for years. You know, yes. you, you need to look at that brand. And, um, and so, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? Your customers, your shareholders, your vendors, um, your, your, your employees, they want to see action. And, and we see every day yeah. uh, now this, um, this global movement. And I'm telling people, it's not a moment. This is a movement. So be prepared to take uh, actions that are going to have sustainable uh, results because people are not going to settle for anything less. So any symbols, any signs, any uh, traditions, any norms, any anything that that is a that reminds or celebrates oppression, it's got to go. You know, NASCAR, no more Confederate flags. I mean, come on, this is not new stuff. You know, yeah. and so now what you have is uh, people with an open ear, and 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 fortunately, the low hanging fruit is the things we've been telling them for a long time that you need to do. And so, and I'm talking both, I'm talking com uh, companies, communities, and the country, the military, looking at removing, um, changing the names of military bases, something that's near and dear to me, being an Air Force veteran. Uh, there are bases that are named um, after um, not only uh, Confederate war uh, generals, but losing, um, you know, it's, imagine why would you name a military installation after a general who never who never won a military campaign? So I like it. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that this crisis is truly a platform for for social change. Me too. Me too. And you know, there are some again. Some of this has been politicized, but at the end of the day, this is about the history of America and how we continue to see the historical, systemic, and institutional inequities, injustices, and uh, discrimination. And it's about making some wrongs right. And it's about removing some of those artifacts, those norms, and some of those rituals that have a real sordid and, and unfortunate past, right? That reminds yeah. us of the days of slavery where, it, and not only slavery, but not being able to vote, not being considered, considered human, and literally being yeah. killed and lynched because of your race. So that's why this conversation is so important. And I don't know yeah. that everyone understood our history and the pain because some people are like, well, that was so many years ago. How do you respond to right. that? when they're, But that was like right. 400 years ago and I wasn't the one who did it. Right, yeah. And, and, and Shirley, um, you know, it's not about us. I mean, we're professionals. We, we, we have oftentimes have to tamp down our own personal feelings as we try to help, uh, you know, companies and communities navigate through this. But, you know, I had a I had a colleague that says, "Well, Shelton, um, you know, why why are people protesting and looting and stuff?" I said, "Let, let me hold on. Let, let me tell you a story. I, I was I was a a, a Air Force uh, officer. I I was pulled over in uniform, in uniform, stop. What I thought was going to be a routine traffic stop." I didn't think I was speeding, but the officer didn't even stop me for speeding. He said, he asked me to step out of the car. He asked me to put my hands behind my back, mm. handcuffed me, took me back to his cruiser. Um, and you know what he said? That I matched the description of someone who had just, uh, who had just broken to a private residence. Imagine this, it's 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. I'm in full uniform. And mm -hmm. what sense, what, it, it doesn't even make sense, it still doesn't to this day, that he would think that a, a, a military officer would break into somebody's house in the middle of the day in uniform. And so, you know, I still to this day, he, 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 he called it in, it was clear that, you know, uh, wrong call, wrong person, wrong uh, everything, no apology, took the handcuffs off, didn't, you know, and, no, and, didn't, and dismissed me with not even as much as, have a good day, I apologize. Wow. And, and I can go on and on and on. And I've had to tell that story to my sons over and over. And, and so people that, that don't understand 
you know, both the literal and the figurative knee on the neck. Um, and that's, that's a hard conversation. And so I, it, what I've been trying to do is have conversations with people who have stood on the sidelines silently, um, having heard these stories, having known about some of these situations and never took any action to, to do anything. It's that silent majority. And that's why I'm, I'm slightly optimistic that this movement is going to bring about some changes because finally some of the folks on the sideline who have been silent have come off the sideline and are now active in trying to bring about some change. And I know you've got similar stories. Um, yeah. It's not identical. Absolutely. And you know, what's interesting is this is a watershed moment. And I keep asking others, why do you think now, right? Because we've been having this conversation. I've been a chief diversity and inclusion officer for four major organizations. Three of them were Fortune 50 companies. And then I was, you know, chief diversity officer for the world's largest HR association, traveling all over the world, working in 30 different countries with leaders from all levels in the organization. And most of those at the very top don't look like me, right? Most of my uh, my clients are ones who are calling me because they're like, we don't know how to have this conversation. We don't know how to do this work. We don't know how to address this issue. And so, but yet I'm wondering, I've been working with many, many clients for years. Why now? Why are we seeing such a big push, focus, and an outcry now to where, like you said, you're optimistic that there will be change? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think the, the, the audience, again, would appreciate uh, hearing uh, us talk about um, how these murders, let's, 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 let's not leave that, because especially given the fact that just over the weekend, we had another killing right here in Atlanta. Uh, how, how have the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and now Rashad Brooks, how, how and, and, and then the resulting protest, protest, how has that impacted you? Because we have to, we're in the, we do this for a living. So we have to constantly talk about this, constantly talk about it. We, we don't get a break until we go to sleep at night. We've got to talk to families. We've got to talk to friends. We've got to talk to allies. We've got to talk to companies, communities. How, how is it affecting you? Let's talk about you. How are you doing? How is this impacting you? Thank you. Thanks for asking. It, you know, for the first th four or five days, I couldn't really talk about it, not publicly. I couldn't, you know, and I'm very, very visible on social media. And I'm always putting out blogs and statistics and, you know, have you thought of and putting out, you know, just content. And I was just paralyzed. And I knew that people were wondering, OK, when is Dr. Shirley Davis going to say something? Right. She's a DNI expert. But I was paralyzed with anger, hurt, sadness disbelief, frustration, here we go again, for a couple of reasons. One is because, like you said, we've been in this work for so long, and it's like, we, what, what kind of progress have we made? So I was having a little bit of a pity party there, but the other thing I was having really with some real crocodile tears was because George Floyd, every time I saw that video, and I, I, after a while I just couldn't see it anymore, I saw right. my three brothers, right? I am big sister to three of my brothers who are gainfully employed, essential workers. One was a former police a police officer in Washington, D.C. My dad is 77 years old, and I've got nine nephews between my three brothers. And I saw their faces, every one of them, when I saw the f police officer allowing right. this life to be just, just totally right. zapped. So that was really hard for me. They're all still now. They're precious to me and they're law abiding citizens. And yet, right. you know, they could have been the one that maybe someone gave a twenty dollar bill to who was a, what, that was a counterfeit bill. And they could have been in the same place. They have been stopped so many times. My brother, who was a police officer, has been stopped because he was in plain clothes and they didn't know he was a police officer. So it yeah. could have been any of them. And that was the hurtful part for me. And I wrote a, a blog on my uh, social media site and LinkedIn called, I want to live and I want to breathe. But I say that right. because I want my brothers, my dad, my nephews, my colleagues, you, you're my colleague and I see you right. in those right. pictures all the time. Right, um, and thank you uh, for that. And, and I think, um, again, you know, everybody, I can't, I don't know anybody that hasn't been personally affected by what's going on, but for, my, for myself, in 2000, in the summer of 2015, um, I think June, June, July 2015, 
we had experienced in, in a 12 month period from uh, June of 14 to June of 15, 114 uh, killings of uh, unarmed um, black men. You know, so, you know, here we are in, in 2020, um, and, you know, we thought that, um, you know, Trayvon and, um, and, 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 and all those Can killings. Right, you know, Freddie Gray, yeah, you know, I mean, all of them. Yeah, yeah, Eric, Eric, uh, Eric Garner, Garner, everybody. Yep. And, 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 and I wrote about it uh, in, you know, in a book in 2015 called Crisis as a Platform for Social Change from Strawberry Mansion to Silicon Valley. And, and I says, and I talked to both, you know, the communities that were affected by those murders, as well as law enforcement. I wanted, it's a, it's a, I wanted to find out from them, you know, what, what, they, what they thought about it. I, I had hoped that I would never have to deal with a situation like that again, not on this kind of a scale. And here we are in 2020. So I was severely um, impacted by it. And, you know, I've been asked by, um, you know, publisher and friends, are you going to write a, you know, a second edition or whatever? And I says, I, I need some time. I need some of my own personal time to be able to process this. So it's yeah. still pretty, it's still pretty, uh, it's still pretty raw. Um, yeah. Tanya, uh, we've got some questions lined up for us, I believe. Yes, Dr. Good, we have several questions. Um, so the first question I have here for you Sorry, scrolling through just to get to our first question. Uh, this person said, what do you think about Big Brothers Big Sisters partnering with police officers and law enforcement in a program that we call Bigs in Blue or Bigs in Badges, depending on the agency? Um, and as a follow up to that, do you think that we at, at that Big Brothers Big Sisters should accept Department of Justice funding? Um so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer to that. Um, I have to I'll be very candid. Um, I was not aware of either one of those uh, things. Um, and, you know, I think what someone's asked me, so, you know, what, what do you think about it? I, I don't like and would prefer not to answer questions off the top of my head without knowing all of the details. But um, I will say that obviously um, I, that would have been a great question to ask of Pam yesterday, but and I'm sure she's getting a lot of questions. Uh, her, the board, all of the different clubs and their boards. That those are so, those are things that um, they're going to have to look at. I will I will answer the question by this before I toss over to Shirley. I, I am dealing with a lot of companies who uh, who are who are being asked things like. Um, what do you know? Your that the company has given money to uh, political candidates publicly as on a record of giving money to political candidates who are not in support of the movement. And I can tell you what I've told them is that uh, you're going to have to uh, look at that and um, you're going to, you do not want to be on the wrong side of, uh, of history. Keeping in mind, I know companies, you know, give to both parties and um, to try to advance what they believe is in the company's best interest. But the companies are now, uh, their shareholders, their board of directors are going to be asking them questions that they've never been asked before. And I believe what the, uh, the, the participant is asking, um, big brothers and big sisters, is, you know, um, is that po are those policies that, um, that are being looked at? And so um, I think that's a question um, for Pam. Uh, Shirley, I don't know if you want to weigh on, yeah. on that from a um, person. I do. I think that it's it's really important that you're partnering, um, that Big Brothers and Big Sisters is partnering with police departments because I'm a big believer, having a brother who was also a, a police officer, of the importance of introducing the police to the community and allowing young children, of allowing black children, brown children, those who have been mostly affected and infected by police brutality is to try to minimize that the great divide and the disparities that exist. Much of what's happening is that there's just not a lot of community uh, involvement. And I think when young children, when their messages are, you know, that the police are bad, and then the police's message about young black men and young black children is they're bad, they're criminal, right? They're, they're bank robbers and all of that. I think there has to be this education and this partnership that comes together that demystifies both groups where there's a learning, there's an education, 
there is a opportunity to partner with the parents. It's almost like the school systems too with the parents, PTAs, working together as a family. This is a village and I think having that village mentality is very, very important. Now, relative to taking money from the Department of Justice, that's a very political question. So I won't necessarily answer that again for the reasons that Dr. Good said as well, but I do think it's important that if the, whatever funding that you're getting, if it's going to help you better create communities and bridges between the police and between those in uh, underserved communities, underrepresented communities and marginalized communities, then that would be a worthwhile effort. So again, thank you for the work you are doing with helping young children be educated and, um, and build that bridge, build those open communications and conversations because the more that police are in those communities and they know the children and they understand who they are and their situations, there may be a much less amount of bias that happens that causes them to be afraid more than they are concerned. Yeah, and and uh, before we go to the next question, I, uh, in North Philadelphia, um, participated in the Police Athletic League, PAL, um, basketball leagues and, and things like that. And, and, and so we're talking during the period of the 70s. But the law enforcement, uh, Philadelphia Police Department, um, drove the agenda. What I would say to uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and any organization, as you look at your relationships with anyone that is, um, that's right now going to be called into question or going to be scrutinized, is the agency should drive the agenda. And I think to uh, Shirley's points, Dr. Davis's points, there, there are objectives that could be served but I, I believe that uh, the, the agency and the constituents of the agency should drive that relationship rather than the, it being driven by um, law enforcement's agenda. Um, we got another question, Tanya? We do. The next question, uh, you'd mentioned earlier in your conversation, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, and so this person is affirming that and then asking, what are the actions we can take in our communities through our agency for the children and families that we serve. Shirley, let me jump on that one because we, we me and Pam did not get to that. Uh, so I'm going to take only 10 seconds um, because we, it was one of the areas that I wish we had gotten into yesterday um, because I was going to ask Pam, you know, talk, talk, let's talk about some of the things that uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters um, is doing uh, and doing well. And I know that Pam, would want me to uh, uh, reiterate and, and kind of share what her and I had talked about off camera um, before our session, which is the fact of the fact that big brothers, big sisters, what's embedded in your DNA is these grassroots, that you're a grassroots organization, that mm -hmm. you're serving a population that is 70 plus percent people of color and uh, your food drives and your grassroots efforts you, a lot of you are already doing a lot of good things. So I would say continue to do the good work that you're already doing, and then the people that you're serving, go ask them where, where you could better um, um, serve and help them. Shirley? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. The organic and grassroots efforts are really, really key and critical. I think, too, the other ways that you can continue to help is to continue to provide um, community services, com com uh, community education, having, you know, community town halls and having conversations so that people are getting to learn more about each other and to learn more about the availabilities of services. Because one of the things that we saw with COVID-19 was that it hit the black community harder than any other community. And part of that is yeah. because of where they live, um, lack of access to opportunities, lack of access to treatment, lack of yeah. access to even getting emergency care. So I think those are some things that we can help provide, give education to. And I'm a big believer too, with big brothers and big sisters, because my daughter was involved in them in her um, area, in our region, when we lived in, uh, in the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia. And there was a lot of really good activities after school. After school care was very, very helpful, yeah. as well yeah. as life skills, life skills training, preparing our young 
children to be, when they come out, they need to be able to communicate. They need to be good problem solvers. They need to learn how to be entrepreneurs. And to the extent yeah. that you can help them to yeah. get more vocational skills so that they can learn that there's, you know, there's many ways to be successful. And they may not always be going to college. It may be going to vocational schools and starting their own businesses. Those kinds of yeah. things are very, very helpful. Yeah, and, and if you talk, if you really want to get tactical, it's the two things that I am extremely passionate about, and that is disparities um, that I think that big brothers, big sisters uh, could could help, and that is uh, around the technical divide. Um, if you guys could, you know, there are kids that go home and don't have access to um, high speed internet or internet at all, and 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 trying to create some uh, literacy around uh you know technical uh technology um, um skills and then the other one is um around finance around finances is that um we really 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 need to do a better job um especially considering you're 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 serving a population of 70 percent or more people of color um enhancing financial skills and financial literacy Absolutely. at a much much earlier age these things are not being taught at schools, so agencies like uh, nonprofits, churches, agencies like Big Brothers, Big Sisters have to step into that gap. But those are the two things I'm personally passionate about. Let me add one other thing to that too. This is for the staff. Is that we? I appreciate that we're serving, you know, the community. Like you said, 70% of them tend to be people of color. But I'd also to say, please ensure that you're trying to attract more diverse talent, visibly diverse talent that looks like the children and the communities that you serve, so that they yeah. see a example and a model of someone who has, you know, skills and experience and positions and title and power and authority. So as much as you can, because I saw too the earlier part of this, Shelton, was 70 or more percent of those who are joined are white, right? And not that that's a bad thing, but I'm just saying if you're serving a more diverse community, and I say this to all organizations, corporate and private and federal sector, please try to look more and be able to relate better so that you can ultimately serve the communities that you that 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 you work in and do business in. Absolutely. Tanya, you, you want to squeeze in one more? Because I've got, there's one question that I just absolutely I want to talk. There's one air, one topic that I definitely want to talk to Shirley before we run out of time. But I do want to also answer as many questions as we can. So let, yeah, let's yes. take another. Yes, we have many more. So what I do want to say to our attendees, if we don't get to your question uh, on the live webinar, we will be able to respond individually to your questions. So please continue to enter your questions if you'd like us to respond if we're not able to do so on the call today. So the last yeah. question or possibly the last question is, are there any resources that you would suggest that individuals look into, especially those of us that are white and are hoping to learn more about how we can make a systemic change in our organization, communities, and country yeah. overall? In other words, what yeah. is the first step you would suggest we take to learn and be more open-minded besides just reading books and articles, watching the news, et cetera? Oh boy, that's so funny because that's exactly the topic that I wanted to talk about <laughs> is this, this topic of, of, of allies. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a breath <laughs> because uh, I'm going to go to my good friend, Dr. Davis, have her respond first, and then I'm going to piggyback on that because that's the exact topic that I was going to bring up to next to her because we as experts are being asked this and we expect, expect it. But what I'm hearing from a lot of people, particularly in the black community, is, is how many questions they're getting like this from uh, from their white friends, family members, colleagues, neighbors, and 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 they are beginning to feel a certain way about the question. But uh, we're they're, they're acting us as experts. So Shirley, I'm gonna come to you first. So a couple of things. I heard what can we do in addition to books and that kind of thing, but that is very important. There is a couple of great movies that's out that I would say if you want to really understand the Black experience and the hurt, the pain, and the trauma, that there's a, a couple of things out there. So, for example, recently Warner Brothers made it available, and I think it's on demand now for free, Just Mercy is a wonderful, wonderful, great movie, wonderful acting. So stars Jamie Foxx 
and Michael B. Jordan. Those are really great actors, but the storyline, which is a true story, really, really does give you a good sense of institutional racism and how it's uh, affected us. There's another one called um, The New Jim Crow. It's a book, but there's also some information of it on the, um, on the YouTube. So you can check some of those out as well. I know a lot of you, especially my white counterparts that's joined us today, have been hearing a lot about Dr. Robin D'Angelo's book on white fragility. Why white people don't like to talk about this tough topic called race. I think that's great because she totally wrote it as a white woman to her white colleagues to say, here is what we need to think about. Here is how we need to really be more thoughtful uh, and really check ourselves as well too with the white privilege and power that we do have and how we can be better allies. So that's another great one. Um, there's another good, um, it's research called The State of Race in America. There's a great YouTube uh, video out called Don't Be Color Blind, Be Color Brave by Melanie Hobson, who is a CEO of um, a, a Fortune 500 company as well called Aerial Investments. Uh, I recommend uh, a couple of others. Let me, so it's a few of them. I'm looking at them now because I keep giving them out. One is called the 1619 Project. That's another really good one if you want to understand. And it's about the year of 1619, whenever the slave trade started. And then when you look at the other one around the new Jim Crow, that's really about the justice system, but it'll also share with you, again, it's a, a piggyback on all of the issues that we deal with with Jim Crow laws, right? Which was all about how do we make sure that even though we've emancipated black people from slavery, but that we're gonna ensure that there are systemic and institutional ways that they still will not be able to ever have parity or equity or ever be able to succeed. So that includes everything from economics to redlining to ensuring that black people can't even get loans. And if they do, they're at a much higher interest rate just because they're black. There is even because you're a black person, your, your um, FICO score is lower just because you're a black person, your race. So it's all of these kinds of systemic and institutional things. I encourage you to look inside of your own organizations. And if, um, as, as Dr. Good was saying, become allies. Look in your organizations and look where you can stand up and speak up against inequities, against microaggressions, when people are marginalized or when people aren't getting access to opportunities, when they're not being treated fairly, when you know that they're the first ones to be fired, they won't get hired because you know, their skin color, but yet someone wants to hire someone that looks like them, that came from their same community, that came from their same background, their same college or university. As a white person, and I so appreciate the question, is that it's really not our job, even though now it's our job, me and me and Shelton, because we get paid to do yeah. that. But your, yeah. your black yeah. colleagues and friends do not want to keep educating you on something about a painful right. past that we've had when there's so yeah. many resources that's out there if you just right. learn just really seek to understand that will be important so that's the one thing as an ally is don't expect us to teach you but there's so many resources that's out there another step of an ally is to just recognize that there is pain and when people share that pain please don't try to marginalize it and say well i was talking to a person the other day and she said well you know and this was a white woman a very very good friend of mine so i could check her on it but she said to me well you know i've been marginalized as well too Girlfriend, it is not the same. So we have to have the conversation, a real true and authentic conversation. It is not the same. You never had to have the talk with your children about when you turn 16 and get your driver's license, when you hear the talk. Wow. Many of you have not had to have that about being afraid about your child not coming home at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And your fear is that they've been stopped by a police or something has happened in that way. So I could go on and on. Wow. I'll send some um, resources to Tanya. But those, I have a list of about 12 or 13 things you can do to get up to speed on the realities of what we're facing, but also what are things you can do to be an ally? Yeah, and, and so thank you, thank you, Shirley. So um, you hit on several of the points that I was gonna hit on. So I, I, wanted, um, I wanna unpack this a little bit more. So we're gonna stay here for a minute um, because, I, because people now are wanting to do something and, and, and we want to encourage that um, and, but we also want to give you some, some, because this is what Shirley and I get paid to do, give you some specific, specific things that you can do. And so obviously this whole thing about, um, challenging, um, 
inappropriate behavior in the workplace, um, not not uh, tolerating uh, or accepting people um, talking in derogatory derogatory terms uh, about um, other colleagues or anyone in general. You can just simply say, "No, I'm not having it. That's not. Uh, I'm, I, I don't. I don't appreciate that." You know, coming off the sidelines, not being silent, not not thinking that because you yourself are not um, racist or bigoted or whatever, but, but saying, I, I don't want to get involved. That's not my issue or that's not enough. It's not enough to do that. You have to now take affirmative action, not the affirmative. You have to take positive actions to, 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 to help and reduce things. And, and so again, I'm, I'm one of these people that believe people uh, learn best through stories. So let me tell you again, two quick ones about systemic, what systemic racism looks like inside of a company and outside of a company. So I'll go internal first. Was We were interviewing a person to be a uh, engineering supervisor at a company. Uh, and it came down to two candidates. And the hiring manager said, and I was on the I was facilitating the interview panel. And as the panel was debating and giving feedback to the high manager, the high manager says, well, um, a, a, a one of the panel members says, I like, I'll call her Joan. I like, I, I like Joan because she brings this to the job and, you know, uh, she has the strength. The high manager's response was, well, you know, yeah, Joan is okay, but um, she went to Spelman. And is Spelman a good school? And the whole entire committee looked at him like, what planet did you fall off of? You know, um, Spelman is, is, is a great school. They also, also have a great partnership with Georgia Tech, one of the best engineering schools in the, in the country. How is it that this individual who lives in Atlanta and works in Atlanta does, does not know this? And, you, and, and, you, and it can't because he didn't educate himself. It's because systemic biases in the organization favored engineers from Georgia Tech uh, at the expense of everyone else. And that had just filtered and reinforced his own personal um, biases. Um, the good story is the female from um, Georgia, from Spelman did get hired for the job. And, and we use that as a coaching moment for that hiring manager. Um, externally, uh, I'll, I'll go very personal because Shirley brought this up about redlining and credit scores. Um, I was in, in Philadelphia, went to, um, in, I'm sorry, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, 57 miles, a uh, uh, community 57 miles north of Philadelphia, went to buy a home. And you, people say, well, what does being an ally look like? Well, my realtor, who, um, you know, knew that um, a certain area of Allentown was redlined uh, and that African-Americans were not welcome there. She says, I think this would be a perfect place for you. In fact, I'm going to take you to, even though you have pre-approved financing and you're going to use a VA loan, I'm going to take you to a banker who I believe can beat your, the, your rate from Chase. We go to that bank, and that banker not only gave me the bet, did not give me, not only did he not give me the lower rate, he denied the loan outright. And I had uh, a credit score that was, you know, an incredible credit score in pre approved lending. She said, you know what, I'm going to take him to Bank X since you're going to be stupid. We get to Bank X, and Bank X said, uh, of course we're going to fund you, Dr. Good. We're going to give you the, the better rate. But, you know, I need to share something with you. I got a call from the other bank telling me to disapprove you because you wanted to go into this Applewood community, which they had redlined. That's, oh. what, that's what we're talking about. Well, yeah. it's, 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 here is, with, Shirley, you talked about the pain. The, we started off behind the starting line. That's bad enough. We caught up, but then every time we progress, the finish line gets moved. Yes. It's like we always have to be better. We always have to be faster. Our credit score has to be perfect. Uh, we have to have pre-approved lending. We have to have VA, uh, VA uh, guarantees for the loan. Everything for us has to be perfect just to stand an equal opportunity. That's mm -hmm. the figurative knee on the neck. Yeah. That as an ally, you have to understand and get educated 
about these things before you can before you can help. So the resources and then putting those things into action, I think, will help. So thank you for the question because thank you for sharing that. I mean, hopefully, everyone is hearing it's that. Really, you, you, you've got stories like that, I'm sure. Yeah, you've yeah. got stories like that. Yeah, I, I, I put um, I put about five of my personal experiences just yesterday. I put it up on on YouTube on my YouTube channel. And it's on LinkedIn and I share some of my own personal painful stories of being marginalized, overlooked, undervalued, chasing the carrot, chasing, jumping after hoops and everything kept moving. But I hope everyone is hearing just some of our own personal stories. For those of us, we're on the front lines trying to fight and combat racism, injustices, discrimination, yeah. inequalities. Uh, but, yeah. I, you know, there's so many more of us that work with you that work for you and that you serve and i call us hidden figures because we're, we're doctors i want we are phds and i can't right. tell you the number of times that i've been told even in that as a phd and a doctor that i wasn't good enough and you know when you've got to go get all this education all these certifications simply because you're trying to equalize where and right. most people who are telling me to get it didn't even have it themselves so I appreciate all of you listening to us share just some of our own personal stories and experiences, but these aren't made up. These are real life stories that happen every yeah. day, all day. Tanya, we yeah. got a chance for one more question or how do we want to close it out? Yes, Dr. Davis, we I think we'll have time for one last question. I'm going to summarize from a few um, attendees, but I do want to remind all of our attendees that this record this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the conference home website, which is conference.bbbs.org. Additionally, we've had lots of requests for the resources that you've mentioned, so we will uh, compile all of the resources that have been mentioned, and there are others that have suggested. We do have a weekly email that's posted to our workplace group called Race, Relationships, and Resources. So each Tuesday, we send out resources, so be on the lookout for that weekly email that's posted to the National Updates page if you're interested in seeing where all of the resources for diversity, equity, and inclusion reside. So our final question okay. is... A in, now, Tanya, yes, you, may want to, you, may want, you may want to remind them about the panel discussion coming up at uh, 2 today, Eastern Time. Yes, that's, thank you for that reminder. And we also have at 2 o'clock Eastern Time today, we have a panel discussion where Dr. Davis and Dr. Good will be joined by two of our own agency leaders, Alicia Guevara, who's the CEO and president of Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City, and Meredith Crow, who's the president and CEO of BBBS of Low Country, to talk more about uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and their experiences um, as another panel discussion. So if you're able to join us, you can still register for that session as well. So our, our, our final question um, is, I was raised to be kind and respectful to everyone. I was not raised to think differently about anyone because of the color of their skin. And so this person wants to know, they feel pressure to understand and know how to lead their organization because they're they're honestly lost. And so it's essentially, how do I help as a white ally, although I see color blindness, right? We hear this a lot that, you know, I was raised to not see color. Everyone is equal in my eyes. So what do you say to someone who is trying to understand what to do next and how to help? Shirley? Yes, and I know actually that gets to I know unconscious bias, right? Even though you may have been taught that, you know, not to see color blindness, meaning I understand it. I understand that you were taught basically not to treat people any differently because of their skin color, their age, their gender. And that's a really good, honorable thing. Um, but we also, as we have life experiences, as you get around colleagues, as you look at media all the time, we're constantly being programmed even when we don't know that we are and we are making decisions you know, whether you are aware of it, that's why it's called unconscious bias. So what's important to um, in your in your position is to recognize color is important because when you say I don't see color, what you're saying yep. is I don't see you. People have <laughs> right. people have age groups, people have you know different orientations, they have different religious beliefs, but visibly you'll see some things. You see a person who's short and tall, you see a person who may be heavy weight and someone that may be lightweight. We see those things and people want to be seen and they want to be valued. So to ignore that is, yeah, in one regard is I don't use that as a um, hindrance to making decisions. That's great. 
But to say, I don't see you, we're all American. We are, but everyone is not treated fairly as an American. And so as a part of your development, I would say too, is to make sure that you have a broad range of people who you surround yourself with. Be sure to have those open and, and honest, transparent conversations. Be willing to ask for feedback and ask the people to give you any thoughts that they may have on how you treat them and how they feel you know, around you. Do they feel valued? Do they feel respected? Think about some of the decisions that you made. Who have you continued to hire over time? Who do you tend to give preferential treatment to? Who do you put in special assignments, right? And who do you not? Who is in your inner circle and who's not? That will give you somewhat of an idea to where your biases tend to be because even though you may not see color, it's having an effect because you may be around people who all look just like you. Yeah, Tanya, 30 seconds, please, because um, I know someone is asking, um, Dr. Good, Dr. Davis, what do you guys want? You know, wh what do you want? And, and I would say uh, what we want uh, and what every, uh, and I don't want to come across as though I'm speaking for every Black person, but I think I can safely say that what we all want is, is what the country is supposed to be about. Right now, it's a two-state nation. We want one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. We want the same things everybody else wants. Tanya, we'll toss it back to you. Thank you, that was a great conclusion, Dr. Good. Uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Good, again, thank you for your time, for addressing today's questions and being so authentic, open and honest with the attendees. Again, to all of our attendees, we do have another DEI session today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can still register for that panel discussion going to the conference website at conference.bbbs.org. I've also provided that information in the chat if you need to write that down, as well as where you can find all of the resources that we will share with this group. If you visit our national updates page on our workplace group, we provide a weekly Tuesday communication that's entitled Race, Relationships, and Resources where we will list out these and other shared resources for the network. We want to thank Dr. Shelton Good and Dr. Shirley Davis for your time and expertise. Thank you so much to our attendees and have a wonderful day. Thanks for being brave and courageous, everyone. Great to see you yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs>